we may have witnessed the greatest UFC card of all time. And we're going to recap the whole card from the early prelims all the way up. We're going to also talk about who should each winner fight next. Maybe even the losers as well, too. And some memorable moments were like Max Holloway winning with one second left on the clock. He was winning the fight. But because of that knockout, we have recorded clips on stream of uh, me making over $400 out of a $14 bet for picking Holloway to get a win in the fifth round. And this card overall was just, I think you could easily say a 10 out of 10. Maybe bump it down to 9 out of 10 if you're a harsh critic. But I thought it was an overall super fun, impressive card. And I enjoyed myself. So let's recap it all the way from the beginning. The first fight being Figueredo versus Cody Garbrandt, which was a good fight. I mean, when it started in the first round, I thought Cody was the one that was landing the better shots or at least quicker to the punch. But what happened and what most people, I think, expected was that the grappling played a factor for uh, Cody Garbrandt versus Davison Figueredo. Um, I think the chin of Cody Garbrandt as well, too, is what most people were worried about and whether it would hold up. Figueredo looked pretty dominant. And also, um, we start thinking about him as far as at 135 and whether you put his name in the hat for the next one to fight for the title because there are other names out there. We know, we know Marab is going to get the shot against Sean O'Malley, but if for some reason Marab is hurt, who should get the title shot next? Should it be Corey Sanhagen? And who wins? Because Figueredo has spoken about, listen, I believe Marab is going to win and I want the Marab fight. I think that's a pretty interesting fight. Not as interesting to me as like a Sean O'Malley versus Corey Sanhagen, um, you know, or just two strikers going at it. Figueredo and Marab will be more grappling and, you know, Marab kind of just hugging a hip and holding on for dear life. I'm sorry. I'm not the biggest Marab fan, as you've probably noticed, but we shall see. But overall, a good performance for Davison Figueredo. The next fight on the card was Bobby Green. So we started 1-0 with Figueredo versus Garbrandt. But then it was Bobby Green versus Jim Miller. Listen, I genuinely thought Bobby Green, after the way that he lost to Jalen Turner, there was no way he was going to come back and be 100%. And I thought Jim Miller was eventually, no matter how many times he got hit, would eventually find the chin of Bobby Green and hurt him and knock him out. Well, Bobby Green came back and he looked good. He had a dominant performance. And I don't know if we can say that, you know, his chin is not compromised because there were moments that Jim Miller hurt him. I believe it was the third round where he stunned him for a bit and then they fought out of the clinch and he was able to recover. But at the end of the day, Bobby Green gets a win after coming off a vicious loss against Jalen Turner. Gets the win against Jim Miller. Jim Miller fought out UFC 100, UFC 200, and now UFC 300, but falls a little bit short. Bobby Green does get the win. The next fight being Jessica Andrade versus Marina Rodriguez. Not the most entertaining fight. It was a split decision win for Jessica Andrade. It was close. I felt it could have went either way. I picked Andrade to win, and I thought the fight should have been given to her. She gets the win. Moving on to Renato Moicano versus Jalen Turner. Guys, one of the most frustrating things I've ever seen was what Jalen Turner did in the octagon where he got the knockdown, and he walked away as if he was Max Holloway versus uh, Justin Gaethje at UFC 300. He walked away as if he just knocked him out cold. But Moicano got back up. He was still hurt. And Jalen Turner had about 13 seconds left to try to finish the fight. Wasn't able to do so. And instead of getting a knockout win, where I truly do believe if he would have jumped on Moicano, I know the jujitsu of Moicano is dangerous. But if he would have jumped on him while Moicano was compromised, I think he would have got the knockout win. Instead, he walks away being too cool for school. They go to round two. And ground and pound finish for Moicano. This is another one where I pick Jalen Turner to win. Moicano gets the win. At this point, I'm 2-2 two and two on the card. And I'm wondering who Moicano should fight next in the lightweight division because he now beats number 10. So he, he's going to find himself in the top 10. There's Dan Hooker, a fight that I like that I was thinking about earlier, that if I could pick one for Moicano, not a bad one. I think he's going to stop talking about or calling out Patty Pimblett. He's now moving uh, on to bigger and better things. but. I like the Dan Hooker fight. There's Ganra out there as well, too. We'll talk about Oliveira in the future. But just thinking about names for Moicano, and I do like the Dan Hooker fight. I'm not mad at that one. Overall, a good, impressive performance by Renato Moicano. Now, moving up the card, guys. This man right here, Diego Lopez versus Sadiq Yusuf. Guys, Diego Lopez, I truly believe, is one of, if not the biggest threat at 145. Besides maybe a Max Holloway now, 
that is coming off an impressive performance. But Diego Lopez, when he when he lands, he hurts you. He landed, uh, I believe it was an uppercut uh, on the inside and hurt Sadiq Yusuf and proceeded to get the knockout win. He did the same thing to pass Sabatini where he landed a right hook around the temple and hurt him badly. Diego Lopez at 145 is just a scary fighter. And he called out Movzar Evloev. We know that he fought him before where he fought him, I believe, in like six days notice. He didn't have a long camp. It was very short notice and it still went to a decision. So he wants that fight back. But at 145, when we start thinking about the names that he should fight and how he does. Listen, now he'll be in the top 15 rankings, beating number 13 uh, right here. And man, against Ige, Barbosa, Mitchell, Giga. All these names that I'm looking at right now, even Mozart, um, if I had to bet on Lopez versus most of these fighters in the top 10, I think seven, eight times out of 10, I would pick Diego Lopez to win. I think he's going to be not even a dark horse in the division. I think he's going to be taken seriously now and um, a scary fighter and also has that like star appeal. So I can't wait to see what he does next. If I had to pick a name for him, I mean, Bryce Mitchell is still a dead body. He's still sizzling in the octagon after being knocked out by Josh Emmett. So maybe not him. Uh, the cater fight after him coming off a of loss. But you know what? Give him the Movzar Evloev rematch. Movzar Evloev, they call him. <laughs> they, they were calling him as well, too. Remember the decision because he doesn't get finishes. Listen, I think Diego Lopez deserves that shot again. Why not give him that fight and see how it plays out with a full training camp? I'm not mad at that one. There's also Brian Ortega, Yair Rodriguez. But if I had to pick, give him Movzar. I think he deserves it, and I think it's a good fight to run back. The next fight on the card was Kayla Harrison versus Holly Holm. Kayla Harrison looked like a bully in the beginning of the fight. It looked like Holly Holm was trying to make a point, to prove a point, and she got a reversal, a takedown. I think it was like a hip toss that she got a takedown against Kayla Harrison, and I thought to myself, oh, there's levels. This is where, you know, the UFC veteran shows that, hey, it's not the same at the PFL or in Bellator, but... Kayla Harrison was able to bounce back, and then she started to become a bully. I've seen funny comments on Instagram where people were saying that she looks like Triple H and Holly Holm looks like Shawn Michaels, so essentially it's Triple H versus Shawn Michaels. Nonetheless, it was a pretty good fight, and she got a submission rear naked choke in round number two. And at 135, I think because of her age, her experience, even if it's outside of the UFC, that they're going to fast track her to the title at 135 in the women's band and weight division. And I think that's okay because, I mean, what other big names are there in Bantamweight? I mean, Raquel Pennington is your star or your, ch not even star, Ra Raquel Pennington is your champion. So they desperately need big names. And I think this is a good way to introduce Kayla Harrison and to give her a shot at the title and just to see how she does. I think she beats Pennington. I think she beats Pena. I think she's going to find herself getting the title eventually. My genuine, honest opinion. Moving up the card, Aljamain Sterling versus Calvin Cater. Fun fact, Aljamain Sterling was the only fighter, the only winner to not be interviewed. I mean, how bad of a performance, all the winning you have to have for the UFC to say, you know what, unplug the mic, you're not getting a post-fight interview, let's move on to the next fight, which was Heary, right, and Rakic was a good fight. But Aljamain Sterling gets the win, and I understand a win is a win. Don't get me wrong, 100% agree. The problem is, if you're going up in weight, to try to get a title shot, I believe you need to make a statement. And that fight simply wasn't a statement. That fight was the most boring fight between the women and the men's fights on UFC 300. And if you're going up and wait again at 145 and you want the Taporia fight, I think you just simply have to make more of a statement. And he wasn't able to do so. I mean, it was the most boring fight on the card. He had an opportunity, in my opinion, to win in impressive fashion, to maybe... Uh, be the backpack as he usually is and get the submission win a rear naked choke he had the opportunity to get a 300k bonus and it was funny because in the press conference when they announced that there's a 300k bonus opportunity he was one of the most excited ones as if he was gonna go for it 300 it's done let's go let's go stop asking me questions the fight was extremely boring and I mean, not surprised if his best friend is Murad because he's also one of the most boring fighters. I know people talk about him carrying Henry Cejudo around. But listen, at the end of the day, Murad, he's being smart and being entertaining outside the octagon. A fighting style inside the octagon isn't the most entertaining. And the same goes for Aljamain Sterling. Again, the most boring fight on the card. They didn't even get a post-fight interview. I mean, that's embarrassing.
Let's just be honest. I like the Brian Ortega fight. If I could pick a fight for Sterling looking at the rankings right now, I like the Brian Ortega fight. Two grapplers going at it. Maybe they go for submissions, reversals, some wrestling, some, you know, nice transitions and exchanges. But besides that, I think there's no shot that he gets a title shot next or a massive fight. The Ortega fight is probably the biggest fight that he could get. And I'm not mad at that one. Maybe give him Brian Ortega. Now, the next fight was Gary Prohaska versus Alexander Rakic. Till this day, April 2024, Gary refuses to check a leg kick. Rakic was winning 95% of that fight. Rakic looked incredible, landing the bigger shots upstairs, landing some massive leg kicks that were making Harry consider switching stances. That's how bad and chewed up his leg was. But Harry finds the mark eventually in round two and hurts Rakic and he goes for the kill. And Harry is one of those fighters that at this point, no matter how hurt he is, you can't count him out. Because if he's still breathing, if he's still standing, he has a shot to potentially come back and get a win and as far as next fights for Iri Prohaska at light heavyweight what I was thinking was maybe giving them a Magomed Uncle Live fight if Uncle Live doesn't get the title shot next although I would imagine that he does and let's say Magomed does get the title shot next I know Jamal Hill is coming off a knockout loss but that fight was supposed to happen for the title Harry got hurt Glover fought Jamal Hill why not put together Jamal Hill versus Harry and see what would have happened if they would have fought for the title if Harry's not going to get the shot next because he did lose to Pajeda by knockout. So I can't imagine they would make that fight again at the very moment. So why not make it Harry and Jamal? Number one versus number two contender. I think that's the way to go. And after that performance as well too, I also wish that that fight was on the main event instead of the early prelims. But that also got a performance bonus, which was great for Harry. He deserved it. Well deserved for Harry. He gets the win. I like Harry versus Jamal Hill. You guys let me know if you guys think that option is a good one. The next fight on the main event was Bo Nickel versus Cody Brundage. Now, although Bo Nickel got a win, impressive win, not so much. He did get the win. He did strike with uh, Cody Brundage a little bit. Got caught, I, I believe, with a few shots as well, too. But um, are we setting the standards too high for Bo Nickel? Because I guess we're expecting for him at this point to run through every opponent. But against Cody Brundage, he wasn't able to do so. Like, he did against Jamie Pickett like he did against Val Woodburn. You can also say Cody Brundage was like the first 185-pounder that Bo Nickel has fought. So um, is he still hyped up? Listen, I don't think so. I'm dying to see the day where we could maybe get Bo Nickel and Hamza Shemaev just because I want to see how both of their fighting styles and their wrestling go against each other and how that plays out. But now that Bo Nickel has beat Cody Brundage, it's about time that you give him someone in the top 15. And I think a perfect name is someone like Paul Craig, because if you're trying to fast track him or if you're trying to protect him, which I'm assuming the UFC wants to do, by putting him in the main event against Cody Brundage is give him maybe not a so much dangerous striker. And that name will be Paul Craig. I think that's a good one to kind of give him someone in the top 15, um, unless they want to give him another name. But I like Paul Craig as an option for Bo Nickel, a decent performance at most for Bo Nickel. Now, moving up the card, Armin Saryukin versus Charles Oliveira. You guys saw on stream me dyeing the hair blonde and me being excited for Charles Oliveira. And when he got, I believe it was an outside leg kick, Armin falls to the ground. Oliveira lands on top and he's on top mount. I'm thinking this is the beginning of the end. He's going to get the finish. It's easy for me to say in hindsight, but should have been just a tad bit more aggressive. He should have tried to rain elbows and get some damage on Armin. Yeah, he went for little submissions here and there, but essentially he didn't really inflict that much damage. And that was frustrating to watch because although he may have won round one, it was a clear round two win for Armin Saryukin. And in round three, Armin got a decent amount of ground control. So I can see why you can say 2-1 Armin. I can also see... And is this a little bit of fandom playing? Is this a little bit of pettiness? Perhaps. I can also see the judges giving it two rounds to one for Charles Oliveira. And one judge had it 29-28 because he at least went for a Darce choke. He at least went for a submission. He tried to finish the fight. Armin at the end of the day, and disclaimer, this is where I might sound like a hater just a little bit. Armin at the end of the day, besides elbows in round two where he opened up a cut on Oliveira, didn't really go for the kill. He was content with just getting a takedown and just kind of, you know, laying and praying and just staying on top of Oliveira, but not necessarily doing much. And at least for me, that performance right there, 
I'm not convinced that he does well against Islam Mahashev. If anything, I think Mahashev should be like a minus 300 or 400 favorite still. And I still believe he beats Armin. That performance right there doesn't, doesn't impress me or doesn't convince me that he beats Islam Mahashev. But what was also interesting as well, too, is that Saryukin's team has said that at, right after the fight, we were offered Islam Mahashev and they neglected. That's why they gave it to Poirier instead. And I guess they agreed that they are not going to rush into a title shot after this win. And I don't know how I feel about that yet, but just a quick opinion is that why not take that fight? He didn't really receive that much damage. Maybe it's a smart thing to do. It reminds me of Drick is not rushing into a title shot as well. And now Saryukin should be the number one contender. And perhaps now he gets the winner of Poirier and Islam, which I would argue Poirier still has a decent chance to win that fight. I know I'm going to get some hate for that comment, but a lot of people got hate for the comment of Holloway beating Gaethje, and that happened. So all I'm saying is Poirier has a decent chance. Nonetheless, Saryukin gets the win, and it appears that he's going to get the winner of Poirier versus Islam Mahashev. Decent, decent win. Now, moving up the card, guys, the fight of the night, the performance of the night, Max Holloway versus Justin Gaethje. I mean, one second left on the clock, guys. Let me see if I could pull a real quick shout out to Max Holloway, guys. We bet 14 bucks, and I'll, and I'll admit it was out of anger a little bit. Uh, the straight bet after Oliveira lost, I said, you know what? I can see Holloway pulling this one off. We made a straight bet, you see right here, in round number five to win for Max Holloway. And there was literally, and, and we won 420 bucks out of a $14 bet. And the first thing you think of is, man, I should have bet more to win more. But nonetheless, Holloway gets the win. In the fifth round where he pointed to the middle of the canvas and invited Gaethje to meet him in the center and just slug it out. And I think what makes it even more impressive, and you see comments like this online, is that Max Holloway was winning the fight. He was cruising to a decision. He didn't have to necessarily go right to the middle of the octagon, invite Gaethje, and have a slugfest. He could have got caught. He could have lost the fight. But I guess this goes to what he was saying outside of the octagon, where he said in an interview prior. Listen, I'm a gladiator. Gladiators don't walk around with a scale. That was one of the coldest lines that I have ever heard from a fighter. And he lived up to it. He wins by knockout against Gaethje. And the argument was that I've made myself was that, listen, perhaps Max Holloway is not going to come back the same after fighting Gaethje. He's going to take too much punishment. He's already taken a lot of punishment in his career. At this point in this fight, after this fight, he might not be the same. We got to start talking about Gaethje might not be the same after that knockout. We've seen him be knocked out cold before, but this time, the way he was knocked out by Holloway face down in the canvas, there's an argument that he might not be the same. It's, I, I was even considering maybe seeing him against Islam Mahashev or fighting for the title again. At this point, Holloway might have a shot at the title at 155 and 145. Now, the next fight for Holloway, I believe, is Taporia. Deserves it. He gets two bonuses, 600K, but... That's the obvious fight to make next. People were saying that Topori looked a little bit scared even just watching that fight. He was in attendance. Holloway had unequivocally, without question, the best performance at UFC 300. There's no other way to talk about it. Beautiful, beautiful performance by Holloway. Moving up the card, Zhang Weili versus Yang Xiaonan. Now, I have never seen someone win by TKO, submission, and decision in one single fight, but you can argue that Zhang Weili accomplished that. In the first round, in the closing seconds, Yan was literally put to sleep. The bell sounds, her eyes are closed, she gets back to her feet somehow in some miraculous fashion, and the fight continues, round two, round three, then Zhang Weili knocks her down, but it essentially ends up in a decision win for Zhang Weili. Good fight, and there were moments that the fight was shifting where it could have went for Yan Zhaonan if she just landed some more shots. Nonetheless, Jean Willy gets the win, and I do believe that Tatiana Suarez will be up next, but Jean Willy retains her title. And last but not least, guys, Jamal Hill versus Alex Pejeda. And guys, I almost can't look straight at the camera because it didn't go as I imagined. And that's how um, 2024 is going for me. Um, I've had some good picks, but I've had some terrible ones. And this is where I have to come clean. This was a terrible pick by me, picking Jamal Hill. I mean, what was I thinking? What was I smoking? Is a genuine question. Jamal Hill got slumped in the first round, guys. Clear knockout. He got caught with what 
it appears everybody gets caught with. The same way I warned Bryce Mitchell over and over again, not that I have a relationship with him, but <laughs> that I was saying to the chat is, Bryce Mitchell, there's one thing that you must do. You must avoid the overhand right. I metaphorically was speaking with Jamal Hill, and I said one thing over and over again. There's one thing that you must avoid. That's the left hook by Pejeda. I know you're coming off an ankle. I know you're coming off an Achilles injury. So that worried me a bit for my pick as well, too. I, I did admit that I wasn't confident in the Hill pick. But I said, listen, if his Achilles isn't an issue, if he's sharp, if he's 100%, I can see him beating Pejeda. Again, sounds silly. I admit, you guys were right. I was essentially wrong. Tough to say. It wasn't the Achilles that caught him. There was a moment where Hill lands below the belt. And Herb Dean tries to get in the way. And Pajeda goes, chill, chill, chill. I got this. Pushes Herb Dean out the way. Kind of gives him a stiff arm to Jerry Rice. Proceeds to walk forward. Lands a left hook. And the way that Hill got knocked out was very similar and reminiscent of the way that uh, Johnny Walker got knocked out by Jamal Hill. I mean, talk about just the irony. Jamal Hill gets knocked out cold, guys, by a devastating, monstrous left hook by Pajeda. And to me, this guy is like the, the Brazilian Dos Equis. Uh, speaking of Pejeda, the most interesting fighter on the planet. The guy doesn't even speak English, and he has the whole world saying Shama. Knocks out Hill, has knocked out Harry, avenged two losses of Glover. This guy is arguably the biggest star in the UFC right now. And what do you do next with him? He talked about going up in weight and fighting a heavyweight. Now, Dana White in the post-fight press conference or post-event press conference said that, listen, he doesn't think that's a good idea, and that's understandable. But at this point, the world is his oyster, man. Pajeda wins by impressive knockout. And that's essentially the whole card, guys. Pray for a brother because your boy didn't do that good with predictions. I still ended up being 6-5, six 6-6, and five, six and six, something like that. Not necessarily the worst, but definitely not the best. Overall, this card was a 10 out of 10. Entertaining from beginning to end. What's next for Pajeda? You guys let me know in the comments below. What was your favorite fight? What was the most impressive and who had the worst performance? Let me know in the comments below. Be here later for the podcast at 2 p.m. I'll catch you guys soon. Peace.